Like, I'd like to welcome to the platform now uh, the leader of the New Zealand First Party. He joins us by video link. Uh, Winston, uh, lovely to see you again. How are you? Very good, thank you. All right. Did you survive the weather and what has been going on the last week or so? Obvi well, well, obviously you survived, but were you affected in any way? Well, yes, we were affected. There was no power or uh, phone or internet and uh, that, though, and a lot of flooding. But that, compared to a lot of people, was very, very light. Uh, so many people were so sadly, badly affected by this latest disaster that anything that uh, we put up with was minor. Yeah, and boy, we're, we're seeing reports now, Hawke's Bay, uh, East Cape, uh, Gisborne, it looks like uh, there's more bad news to come, Winston, that, that we don't know really the extent of the damage yet. I think that's for certain the case. And uh, as the days go by, the, some of the effects of this, the slips and what have you will continue because of the uh, saturation of the land and also, in many cases, the long tree in the wrong place. Mm. Well, in the midst of all that, uh, and I was amazed at this. The leader of a political party that is in Parliament, uh, Te Pata and Māori, the Māori Party, uh, on Valentine's Day, day before yesterday, the 14th, um, put out what I consider to be one of the most remarkable blogs I've ever seen in my uh, time uh, covering politics or indeed anything in New Zealand. And that was a blog which celebrated indeed exalted an historical event being, and I'm not going to call it the murder because it was in the context of a conflict um, between the people of Hawaii or Hawaii um, and Captain James Cook, probably the greatest, one of the greatest explorers of all time. Um, and uh, Rawiri uh, Waititi blogged essentially to the effect that good on the Hawaiians for killing Stabbing and eating um, Captain Cook all those years ago. Um, this is a great thing, uh, a great blow against colonialism. And I'm just going to say on, on a lot of levels, personal included, I found it a highly offensive thing for someone to say, and particularly, uh, Winston, for a member of parliament to say and the leader of a parliamentary party. Uh, I went as a result on social media and looked that that provoked a lot of people to express similarly violent and dare I uh, say it, savage emotions on social media. Uh, do you think that is an appropriate thing for a New Zealand politician, a member of parliament, to say? Look, there's an old saying that the malady of the ignorant is to be ignorant without knowing it. So here we are centuries later, and that's the number one thing on his mind on Valentine's Day, which is not even a New Zealand day in that context. It really comes out of America. Uh, but here we are, centuries later, he puts that uh, out and the, the Green Party, Jack McDonald, mm -hmm. who looks uh, seriously European to me. Oh, he is he, yeah. He is agreeing with him as well. And it's like, you feel like uh, saying to them, don't you know anything about the Maori background pre-European pre times? Do you remember the level of violence and utu that was going on at that time in our lives and what led up to the Treaty of Waitangi. It's as though uh, they don't remember Ngāpūs uh, and the invasion down in the south in their part of the world, or they don't remember what happened at uh, Chatham Islands with the Moriori when the people from the, the west got there, having commandeered a ship, so that the last person, Bill Som Solomon, uh, sorry, Solomon, died in 1936, the last full blood of Moriori. The tribe in that context had been wiped out. They carry on as though they are blameless and that everybody is uh, down on them and that the colonisation was the worst thing possible without having any balance whatsoever. Mm. And centuries later, that's the number one thing on their mind. They're mm. in a race to the bottom of virtue signalling, of virtue signalling and anger. Mm. Do you think Rawiri Waititi uh, really holds views that he'd love to see more Utu exacted against the colonists? Or do you think he says this to rile up, um, if you like, middle New Zealand? No, I think he is in a race with some of the Maori members of the Labour Party 
in a venture to capture the so-called Maori boat, not understanding that the mass majority of Maori are getting on with their lives and want to be part of a model civilised society where education and skills and jobs and opportunity and a decent life is provided by a decent wage system. All of those fundamentals are what the mass majority of Maori are focused on, but sadly, in the name of the many, they make these claims and they make these statements. They're of the people, so to speak, but they're not for the people. Mm. Yeah, Winston, I think you've just made a very good point, and I watched the reaction on social media over the last couple of days and the feedback we got, and suddenly a lot of people saying, bloody Maoris, they're at it again and everything, and suddenly it's actually a divisive thing to do. It actually hardens attitudes and it increases disharmony. And I'm not going to say racial disharmony because I think New Zealand's past that. But, boy, it gives those who might hate for reasons of ethnicity or race, it gives them the perfect opportunity to reinforce their wacky prejudices on both sides, Māori side and, and if you like, Pākehā or non-Māori. Well, you're right. In this context, you see, it's as though it's the Dolph saying in the law, he who comes to equity must come with clean hands. And these people are coming to this argument as though they're blameless, they're faultless, they were living a life of paragon and virtue and love and affection. Now, the one people in this country who were living that way, an almost unique, probably only two other examples around the world, were actually the Moriori who practised a life of peace and harmony. Violence and things like that were eschewed from their culture on that island, and that's why they became such victims uh, when the outsiders who were Maori arrived and took over uh, their um, uh, islands, so to speak, or those islands out there uh, in the Pacific. And here we go, and these people are like Rawari and like uh, Jack McDonald, very, very Maori name that is, isn't it? Uh, anyways, <laughs> there they are, virtue signaling as though they are faultless and blameless, and their people's history is, as I say, a model of virtue, and everybody else is wrong. They have learned nothing in the need for this country to go forward with a sense of unity, which is our only chance of being a first world nation, delivering to all its citizens the best we possibly can. I note that um, David Seymour, in fact, we had him on the show yesterday, has condemned this. He says this isn't a breach of privilege um, because it wasn't said in Parliament, but he's going to invite Rawiri to repeat this in Parliament. It does seem crazy to me and many others that behaviour from a member of parliament in this context cannot be censured or that the speaker cannot become involved simply because it was outside the chamber. Surely it reflects poorly on the institution and democracy in New Zealand. Well, it's not a breach of privilege. David's wrong about that. Well, no, he said it's not a breach of privilege because it didn't happen in parliament. And I think he expressed some frustration. Even if he said it in Parliament, it's not a breach of privilege. Mm. The reality is that there's nothing in the um, standard manual of conduct of the rules of Parliament mm. uh, which den denies people the opportunity to make themselves look like total idiots in front of the public. <laughs> That's what's happened there. Yeah. He's looking like a total idiot, cannot think forward of what do his Maori people need. They need, you know, safe, affordable housing. They need uh, access to the, the health system for everyone. They need ed educational escalators to climb on and take their young people as far as they want to go. And they need first world wages. But he can't focus on that. No, they go and pick at every scab and scratch there is trying to manifest a popularity. And, of course, they'll come and go like lightning. They won't last long in this business. Mm. Uh, Winston, what do you think of Captain Cook? Well, again... You know, we've all had experiences of uh, in other countries of discovery and when the clash of cultures happened, it's always been rather bad. But here's the real point. Uh, he was one of the world's greatest explorers. I was talking to someone who was related to a maritime uh, researcher and cartographer, so to, to speak, when it comes to this country. And they were working for the military at the time following on from Captain Cook's work, and there were only two parts of this work that they could tweak because it was slightly wrong. 
His work was so perfect. He's famous worldwide for it. But of course, uh, with the clash of culture, which happened between Ireland, between England, between the Scottish, it's happened everywhere. And it was rife in the Maori world as well. That's the point I'm making. He's without fault to throw the first stone. And here's Rawali with a lot of faults in his own background in terms of all of our backgrounds and my background as well in the Maori world, claiming that they are angels of virtue. It is ridiculous. And I wish this country would grow up. Yeah. Um, I also have note that some people are telling me they have reported Rawali's Facebook post yesterday for hate speech. Uh, I just think we need to have a discussion about it. Look, while I've got you here... Um, <laughs> speculation is beginning. Some of it started by Tina Nixon, uh, a friend of the platform, and we talked to Bryce Edwards yesterday that, as it seems to have had quite a nice dead cap bump in the polls with the um, carefully orchestrated and planned change of leader from Jacinda Ardern to Chris Hipkins, uh, many are wondering if the Labor government won't strike while the iron is hot or while it looks good in disaster recovery mode and call an early election. Your thoughts on that possibility? It could be seriously likely. Circa 2002, when Helen Clark called a snap election, but there'll only be one reason for that, and that is their worry about their long-term ability to run the country, which is absurdly, patently obvious now, uh, a case of their incompetence in so many areas. And look, if you start to be fair and honest, if you start with a lie, that is that Lucinda Dern st stood down at the last moment when you know the planning had been going on pre-Christmas. If you start with a lie, get the mainstream media to conform and go along with it, and think you can get away with that. I just hope the New Zealand people are much more aware of what the reality is than the public spin hype and uh, claims made by Mr. Hipkins about stepping up at the last moment. No, this was a long way out mm. in the inner circle. And in that inner circle, I honestly think they hadn't even told a lot of their Labour caucus members, but it was planned a long way out and well before Christmas. Yeah. Winston. I I told my team, forget about posting over Christmas and what have you. There's something big coming. Until the dust settles, we'll be wasting our time. Yeah, uh, and I, I think that, that that's good strategy, uh, Winston. Um, we have had the dumpster fire of a number of unpopular policies, though. Everyone I talk to says, have they really stopped doing this or that or have they just parked it somewhere or sent it somewhere else so they could revive it? when they get the chance, and I'm talking about things like the hate speech laws, uh, the TVNZ, RNZ merger, many people not sure if those policies are dead. But the one policy that has not been substantively dealt with or faced is um, Three Waters, and, of course, associated with, with that, the idea, the philosophy of co-governance, which we have talked about before. Do you think Labor are stuck not being able to confront their Māori caucus on that issue? despite the fact that it's one of the highest issues in terms of voters, in terms of things they're concerned about? Yes. They have not dropped it. They've parked it aside. Uh, just come back. There's one thing of those examples I don't agree with. We needed to get hate speech right, but in a way where it was generally about hate speech and not cancelling out other views alternative to your own. Mm -hmm. That's the sad and important thing about democracy. So I think that that does need work on because you cannot have people firing up potential terrorists uh, who are, in many cases, young, uneducated, unbalanced, and when the disaster is over, wiping your hands off and saying, oh, it's all about liberty and freedom. But we need to spend far more work on that. I think setting it off the Law Commission is a good idea. Let's tidy it up. But as for the rest of them, they're all different. We didn't need three waters the legislation. We didn't need co but, but three waters isn't over. That's the one thing they haven't kiboshed. No, no, they, they haven't kibosed any of those other things. They've parked them up. They've said about co-governance, Hipkins is saying about co-governance, oh, we have to do more work on it because people don't understand. Yes, they do. They understand where a small part of the population, probably only 6 or 7%, is in now control of 91%, 92% in terms of co-governance. And he's parked it up on that way. He's not disowned it. He's not said that's the end of it. 
This is not a political change, dramatic change. It's more the same with a different face mm -hmm. from someone who was always in the inner sanctum and went along with it at the time. Mr. Hipkins, if it wasn't bread and butter for the last five years, why were you wasting everybody's time? But you can read a poll. He's done all right. It wasn't a bad strategy. And National, to be honest, by comparison, looked flat-footed and confused. <laughs> well, uh, uh, that may be a fact. But uh, I'm not talking about National. Yeah. I'm not talking about Act. I'm talking about the party that I lead and what we're going to do about it. Uh, and we're going to we're going to stick where we always were yeah. on this principle. I've been saying this for forty years. So you are saying you are not ruling out the possibility of an early election in the current circumstances. Well, actually, I said last year that there was a very great likelihood of that happening because right. I could not see them making it to the next election without them being horribly exposed and being split apart in their inability to deliver on what they told their caucus. Yeah. Uh, and, and what do you think Rawiri should do to put his ridiculous, provocative, brain-dead comments right? Should he withdraw and apologise? Is that enough? Oh, I wouldn't waste any time considering it. I mean, I, I rather regret being on this show, not that it's an important matter, but all we're doing is giving this guy publicity. Yeah, good and point. that's what he does. He loves the shock and horror factor. This is a guy who's assuming everything colonial, but because he's got no hair... He has to wear an American cowboy hat. You see the con contrast here? Nothing's consistent about these people. Yeah. Uh, Winston, I thank you for your time. I'm glad you survived the flood. I need to thank you for getting me the invite to the party. It was lovely to see you up there. Um, and, okay, I'm going to... I had to get the shovel out and shovel a whole lot of drains and what have you to oh. make sure the water was out. But otherwise, having got back inside soaking wet, I knew we were okay. Good on you. Winston, thank you very much indeed for your time. We'll talk again soon. That is Winston Peters, the leader of the New Zealand First Party, and, yep, joins the chorus of condemnation of Rawiri. I think makes a good point. Maybe the guy just says such outrageous things for attention. But interesting, um, you know, what we're running out the flagpole, early election, he says, yep, uh, I think you put Winston in the uh, he thinks it's going to happen column. Very, very interesting. I'm very interested too. And your thoughts and observations are on that issue. Um, Sean, the more Winston speaks, the more I find myself leaning to his party. Call it as it is. If only Winston and David would put differences aside and team up for the greater the good of the country. Or um, especially where the two major parties are simply not ideal, in my opinion. Understandable, one is required. However, no confidence in either. That is from uh, Chris. No, cheers, Chris. Um, Sean Waititi's brain is connected to his bum. I won't comment on his face, for I can't. Uh, Sean, uh, oh, Steve, I could have asked him that, but I wouldn't. Um, Sean, I reported Rawiri's Facebook post yesterday for hate speech, and not a word back from Facebook post is still up too. Uh, we tried to get hold of Ming Foon. He, he hasn't returned our calls, but that may well be... Uh, that he hails fr from the Gisborne region and he may well be dealing uh, with more serious or, or more urgent matters at, at present. So I'm not going to say he's refused to front. I think Ming is probably uh, tied up in relief and trying to help his community uh, right now. Sean Waititi is clearly as dumb as a fence post. And by the way, he wears a colonial hat. Yes, as Winston pointed out. Um, maybe that's just vanity, but it's certainly cultural appropriation of the West of the American West. Um, interesting, interesting calls uh, from Winston Peterson. I'm interested in your reaction.